Last week was Easter Sunday and was out of control. How many people had an amazing time in church over Easter? Um, you know, I feel bad if you were watching online or you, or you had to stay home for any number of reasons. We had uh, a, a little over 1,800 visitors not even... Uh, like just coming to the festival, not even in church, plus like a thousand people like in the church services watching the Death to Life documentary, which is a story of John and Candice Uren who are a part of our church. And if you haven't seen it, go back, look back. But how it's, it's crazy that Easter Sunday was just like last week. I know, it's amazing seeing so many people get exposed and even that story from Megan, it's just amazing to see people exposed to the true realities of faith in Jesus. And part of doing Baptism Sunday here today, uh, the, the Sunday after Easter, is um, this, this is kind of, I'm pointing to the baptism tub right now, this is, this is like really the metaphor of what it's all about in, in like a few seconds. And, uh, and you might be someone sitting here thinking, man, I, I could really use some transformation before God. I could really use something to shift and change in my life. Well, I tell you what, Jesus coming into your life, that is the number one thing that you and I need. Or someone might be sitting here thinking, I'm not sure that I do need to change. I'm not sure that there, there's really much going on that I think is wrong. And if that's true, I want to suggest that there, there might be a little pride going on on the inside of you there and, and that if you allow Jesus to come into your life, you wouldn't even be able to begin to think or ask or imagine as to how your life is in Christ. You just don't know until, until you see it happen and the transformation process happen before your eyes. And so, and that's awesome. Just a, just a few formalities. I really wanna emphasize again what Jerry and Katie said in regards to Spotify. Please go to C3 Toronto Worship on Spotify and click the follow to get some traction on Spotify Matters because these songs, the, the amount of investment and, and what's happening and over the course of the next few months, we need to get some great attraction happening on Spotify because these songs need to get into people's homes. And Spotify only pay attention when they wanna put things on playlists and curated playlists, they only pay attention when there's like a decent amount of following already. They, don't, they wanna make sure in the curation of things and we wanna get on some curated playlists um, because these songs need to go further than they have previously, amen? So let's unify around that and it's just a simple like, you know, follow, follow button, so please do that. Also, you need, if you're a musician, you need to audition for the worship team. You need to audition for the worship team. Do not sit on a talent that God has given you and not play a role. And so it's a simple audition and then you'd be, you know, getting involved in church and getting on stage and, 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 and helping, you know, usher people into the presence of God and helping people like, you know, inviting them into worship. And I mean, I don't have any favorites. All the teams are great at church. So I don't have any favorites. I'm just saying the worship team's a pretty good one. <laughs> it's a pretty good one. And so please, if you, if you especially I just wanna highlight, if you're in the back line, like if you're a guitarist, uh, any kind of guitarist, bass or electric or anything, drummer, keys, any of the back line, please. Because our musicians right now, if you see the same faces on stage all the time, you should absolutely thank them but we shouldn't be seeing the same faces on stage all the time. We should be seeing a healthy rotation because this is all run by volunteers. Same with the production team at the back. So please, just a little formality from your pastor there. Um, also, sorry, just another little housekeeping thing. Just wanted to give you a report on our meeting with the Premier's office. So um, a couple of weeks ago, I didn't talk about this on Easter because, you know, it just didn't feel appropriate on, on that day, but... Uh, we, we have a building that we've purchased as a church and we're trying to uh, rezone it and getting favor with the city is not easy to do. And so, but we met with the executive director of the Premier's office who basically runs the schedule of the Premier's office. It was a very, very favorable 90 minute meeting. And, the, and, and, it, and I'm just telling you that doors are opening. I'm telling you doors are opening. Amen. So you can praise God for that. 
went really well. Just, want, just wanted to highlight that. And I, you guys got the creative clip. Uh, we, the creative team put together just out of their own initiative. This is all volunteers again. I just got to shout out the team and the volunteers. What you did last week for Easter Sunday, you ought to be very proud. Just everybody that was involved, I think over 300 people helped host and welcome our community in for Easter Sunday. Let's give it up for the volunteers. Check out this little clip. He was crucified on the cross, but God raised him from death to life and destroyed the pains of death because death had no power to hold him. So what next? We believe that we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, and we will certainly be in the likeness of his resurrection. Consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Rejoice and let all within us praise his holy name. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> I think they should have just made Pan at the end sneeze or something. <laughs> that would have just tied it up nicely. All right. Um, Romans chapter 6. So what I want to read to you is it's quite theological or Christian deep. In, in Romans, Romans is really what the Christian faith is all about. So if you're new to Christianity, it, and it can be kind of confusing, this whole idea of death to life. What does that mean? And, and is it metaphorical? Is it spiritual? Is it reality? It's, it's all of the above. And, and it ties in the baptism, water, the, the whole death to life experience and what this means. And it actually represents Jesus, what he did over Easter. So the tie in of baptism and Easter is, is together. It's that Jesus went into a tomb and the Bible says that the that the waters of baptism is like the tomb of Christ and that we actually join. What I'm about to read to you is we actually join with Jesus in His death and resurrection. In, so what does that even mean? And all this stuff can be very confusing and very deep. And by the Lord's mercy, hopefully I'll be able to help make some sense of it. Okay, so Romans chapter 6, turn there. What shall we say then? Shall we go on? I just want to ask, the mic's maybe a little bit hot for me. All right. So what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means, verse 2. So Paul's saying, by no means shall we go on sinning. Because what, what the people of, of the area were believing at the time is they wanted grace. They wanted more of Jesus. And they knew that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So they thought the fastest way to get more grace was to allow sin. That's, that's what... It was, like, it was like a surefire thing, right? Like the more I sin, the more I get grace. What I really want is grace. So why don't I just go ahead and keep on sinning a lot? And then and Paul's kind of clearing this up. By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live any longer? Or don't you know that all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized in His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, here I'm talking about Easter, Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too, somebody say we too, may have new life. For if we've been united with Him in death like this, we will certainly be united with Him in the resurrection. Please um, bring my microphone down even more. I don't want to hurt people's ears. And I, when I preach, I preach loud. United with him in the resurrection like this. That's better. Um, verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him. Not literally, but, we, but there's a belief here. There's something going on here that our old self was crucified with Jesus so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. Somebody say, done away with. What does that mean? I'm like, so you might be like 38 years old and you, you meet Jesus and you come to Jesus and then what, the, the 38 years prior to that is done away with? Good question. So that we should no longer be slaves to sin. What, Sam, you're suggesting that I'm a slave to sin? Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that 
I never do a bad thing anymore? That's another great question. Verse 8, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. Verse 9, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery. Somebody say mastery. Over Him. The death He died, He died to sin once and for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. Lives to God. So now, that now there is a new master to God. In the same way, count yourselves. Somebody say count. Or consider. Consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign. Key word there is let. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies that you obey its evil desires. So is sin this like external entity? It's another great question. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any of yourself to sin as an instrument. Your body is an instrument. Your eyes are an instrument. Your hands are an instrument. Your feet are an instrument. Your money is an instrument. Your time is an instrument. Your talents are an instrument. This building is an instrument. Your, your, so what are we doing with the things that God has given us? What are we offering them to? What are we allowing? What are we letting? But rather offer yourselves to God as, as those, as those who have been brought from death to life. There it is. Who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. So there is an identity thing. As those means there is an identity thing. Not you identify with, it's an identity as in it's you and me. It is you. And it is me. So what does that mean, Sam? It's another great question. (laughs) Romans has a lot in it. All right. Verse 14, last verse. For sin shall no longer be your master. There's the word master again. We've heard ruler. We've heard master. And no longer be your master because you are not under the law, one master, but now you're under grace, another master. You're not under the law. These are different kinds of rulers. And when you die to one ruler, you invite another ruler into your life or you identify. So we can identify with the law. Now, the law is literally the rules. It's, it's the pages of the Old Testament. It's all these rules that don't please God. But we're dying to those rules because we're alive to a greater rule. And the greater rule is grace. And so the mastery of law, the law is things like condemnation, guilt, and wrath. These are the rules that come with that master. The rule of condemnation means when you and I mess up, not if, when you and I mess up or the fact that you and I are messed up, the fact that you and I have sin, then none of us cannot sin. You've got bad thoughts. You've got sinful thoughts. They sometimes result in actions, but often they're internal, emotion, judgment, different things going on, pride. You know, when someone gives you a compliment, and you take it on and your head gets big, you just sinned. That's called pride. And we're like, oh man, you know, but I didn't do drugs yesterday. No, that's not what I'm just talking about. I'm talking about the fact that you and I are human beings. And you just sinned a moment ago when you thought that you didn't have any sin. That's how distant you are from God. And so we're all in the same boat. We've all got common ground. But law will do this because law is far off. Grace is close. There's a big difference between those two masters. Law will stand afar off from you and will point at you and condemn you. It will show you where you went wrong and leave you there. That's what it does. And then it will leave you with guilt. But grace doesn't do that. Grace doesn't condemn you. What does grace do? Grace covers. So where law is afar off as that master and says, you are wrong, You suck (laughs) and you should feel bad. Grace comes close, embraces you and covers. Doesn't expose, it covers. And then instead of condemning you and leaving you with guilt, grace acquits the guilty 
What does that mean? Grace stands before the judge as jury and says, I see this person and they are clothed in Christ. The righteousness of Christ is over them. So this person no longer looks guilty. Why? Because Jesus defeated death. So Jesus is guilty. So Bonnie just got baptized today. Bonnie, you are going to make mistakes in life. You are going to feel bad about those mistakes. And the thing that you need to do every time you feel bad about those mistakes is you go to Jesus and you do this thing that Christians call repent, which is simply saying, sorry, Jesus, but I thank you that you stood in my place. And when you do that, he forgives you and he overlays you with himself. And now God doesn't see the thing that you did wrong. God sees his son who is completely right. So grace is close. And I'm, t- I'm teaching what Christianity is all about and why this is so important that we all get it. It frees, it, equi- it acquits you of the criminal charge. The law will leave you in the criminal charge and make you feel guilty. And the last thing is the law will leave the wrath of God in front of you. And we all will face God's wrath. God's wrath, there's not an Old Testament version of God and a New Testament version of God. What's the difference between the wrath of the Old Testament where He would literally flood the earth to deal with sin, where He would literally wipe out generations to deal with sin, where He would deal with idolatry and the earth would open up and suck people in? What's the difference between that nasty God and the New Testament nice God? The difference is, is Jesus being the mediator. So the wrath, Jesus took the wrath of God on the cross. And because the wrath of God came to him and measured him and, and he was found, he was found, he was like, like took a diagnosis of his life and he paid that penalty of sin. Now when the wrath of God comes to us, instead of finding God's wrath, what do we find with grace is we find mercy. That's what we find. What is mercy? Grace is the thing, grace is, um, is we, we get what we don't deserve. And mercy is we don't get what we do deserve. You do, des- every time you breathe, every time you think, and it's laced with this thing called sin, but then your next breath is faith in Christ. And that's kind of the relationship here is your next breath is faith in Christ. And instead of being exposed by the law and facing the wrath of God that's going to leave you in a place of getting everything that you deserve is what we end up getting is God's mercy and grace when we need it most. So I just kind of wrapped up the gospel in a few sentences here or there just to kind of help us understand the goodness of God. Somebody needs to give Jesus a great clap offering. So we used to be dead in sin. Now we're dead to sin. There's a difference. We used to be dead in sin Okay, so now can I preach on? Somebody say amen. Okay, number one, death to life means we are united with a new master. So I already talked about that. And in verse five, we said that we are united with him in death like this. We'll certainly be united with him in life like this. United with him in death is something that you and I can understand. Like that if we are united with Christ, and, and, what, and that he died, and we think that death is punishment, there might be a part of your humanity that thinks when you make mistakes that you are okay with punishment. I deserve a good whipping from God because I'm a bad person. And sometimes our, the reconciliation in our, in our minds is we can, we can come to... But what does it mean to be raised to life in God? Because He doesn't leave us with a death. We die, we die to sin, but now we're united with Him in life. And so many Christians all around the world do not experience the true transformation, resurrection life that God has for you. We love dancing in the guilt and saved and guilt and saved and 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 getting punished by God. We love dancing in that realm. But but you ought to love dancing in life. And if you and I could understand the notion of this new identity that you have in God, even if you gave your life to Christ last Sunday, Easter Sunday, and this is all new to you, I want to suggest to you that maybe before meeting Jesus that you were busy dancing with death. But now you, when you start to do a little waltz with life, I'm telling you, it's so much better. It is so much better. There is a new master. I remember that when I was growing up, 
that my mom and my mom's an interior. She was an interior designer. She's now with Jesus in heaven. Uh, she was an interior designer, and she loved like antiques. And, and anyone know what an antique is? <laughs> anyone sorry they know what an antique is? Anyone feel like an antique? I don't know, but um, some days I do. You know, if I trip and fall down just from not on anything, like it hurts different. It's starting to hurt different. Anyway, so I go, she, but she loved on all our vacations, it was seriously like antique roadshow in my family. We would be, be taken into these musky smelling like, you know, oils and mahogany and teak. Anyone know what teak wood is? I learned growing up that, you know, oh, is it teak? Is it, is it teak? And, you know, like just... This is, this is beautiful. And it's like, I don't know, I never understood the furniture because we, like my, my drawers in my bedroom were, were like 100 years old and nothing functioned right on them. Honestly, I could never shut the drawer properly. It's like, why do we buy this old stuff? Anyway, but the reason, like I didn't have, because mum was in the driver's seat, that's where we were going. Even if I didn't want to go to the antique store, even if I hated it and I wanted to renounce it from my life, and I'm, I know it's a silly metaphor, but... Even if I wanted to rid myself of the hell and damnation of antique shops. When I didn't have a license and I didn't have the authority to be in the driver's seat, that was the destination we were going in. When sin is in the driver's seat, death is the destination. You don't have a choice. Let me say it again. When sin is in the driver's seat, death is the destination. But I want to tell you, when you replace the driver, the destination changes. And even though sin might be crouching at your door, I'm telling you, when Jesus is in the driver's seat, your destination is life. Somebody give God some praise. And so, but we have this thing, we keep doing these things and we need to replace who's in the driver's seat. And that's what you did. That's what you do when you come to faith in Jesus. You're now dead to sin. You're done with that way. And I'm I'm not suggesting, just take the metaphor for what the metaphor is. I'm not saying I'm suggesting I want to be done with my parents. That's not what it's about. What it's about is we want to be done with death being in the driver's seat. And you, you, the only way to replace it is to repent and open up your heart to Jesus. And He comes in and He takes the driver's seat. Jesus, take the wheel, somebody. Number two, death to life means we are immersed Immersed, so baptism literally means immersion. When everybody got baptized today, there wasn't a single part of their body that wasn't wet. Immersion. We are immersed in a new identity. Romans 6 verse 13, which we just read, verse 13 says this. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those, there's the identity, as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself as an instrument of righteousness. So the illustration is metamorphosis, which is a caterpillar going to a butterfly. When you get saved, you go from a place of crawling in some identity, but a butterfly may sometimes resemble a caterpillar, but the rules of life have changed. The rules of, so this new identity is shifted in. Ephesians chapter four, verse 21 says this, since you have heard about Jesus and learned the truth that comes from Him, which I just told it to all of us, throw off, somebody say throw off. Throw off your old sinful nature. But Sam, I still mess up. Okay, we're gonna get there. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. That's how you deal with it. Literally like throwing off this shirt. Nobody wants to see that. (laughs) Which is corrupted by lust and deception. Lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Let the Spirit renew you. Put on the new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So your new nature, just like a caterpillar coming out of a cocoon to a butterfly, is truly righteous and holy. That means that you're no longer comfortable with sin. A scholar said it like this. Let me help you with, because sin is still present, but it's not your identity. There's a difference. I know this is a bit hard to wrap our heads around, but maybe you get this. Identifying with Christ through faith and baptism does not make, does not free the believer from the possibility of sin but it does free the believer from the obligation to sin. Does that make sense? 
So key, key word here is believer. So when you feel the temptations and the pull of sin in life, which you will, the way to deal with it is not to deal with it. The way to deal with it is to believe. Because you understand that your identity is different, your actions will change. It's by association. And so some things that you used to feel comfortable with should start feeling uncomfortable to you. It doesn't mean that everything's going to change in one day, but it's a process of maturity. Ayla, my three-year-old, loves those little baby swings, you know, with the little, like it's the round thing with the harness and you kind of put her up in there and then you cannot get them out. And it's like their shoes, every, everything's, any parent that's like, just, you know, so hard and you're shaking them to try and get the seat up. Can you imagine if I went to the park without Ayla and I hopped in that swing? Push me. It just, it's, it's unnatural. It would feel uncomfortable. And that's what happens. Is some t- when you come to worship and your hands are lifted high in church and you're surrounded by association with an immersion and a baptism of the Spirit and it's here in this place, it's no wonder that when you've got your hands lifted high and surrender in worship that you're not thinking a whole bunch of lustful thoughts. Or if the lustful thoughts come even in that moment, you feel like it feels, it's, it's, doesn't feel appropriate. But you're in the darkness of the corner of that basement back in the old days, like last week. And it feels more comfortable there. But there is a desire, there is a new ruler in the seat. And as you believe, instead of clicking on those things on the computer, instead of doing whatever it is, then there's a ruler inside you that says, hey, whew, there's a new identity in you. Remember, you, you, you renounce that, you're dead to that. And it's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit wills to do God's will. So grace doesn't give us the permission to keep on sinning. It empowers us to be free of sin. So although it's pondering you and although it's tempting you, and these, but after, don't, don't beat yourself up because the, the habitual rhythm changes. Righteousness starts to, it's called, it's, it's what the Christians call this thing called sanctification is we are, we are being renewed day by day. So the mistakes become less frequent. The sins and the things, they don't linger as long. And I want to tell you there, there is hope that you're like, you, would, you hate the way you think sometimes, and I hate the way I think sometimes, and I just don't know how to deal with this. And Paul even talks about this through Romans. Talks about it in 6, 7, and 8, those chapters of like, why do I keep doing the thing that I don't want to do? But there is a promise here that when God is in the driver's seat, when you've changed the master, and the master is now, you, you, you live to God. And as you draw close to God, so the key is not dealing with what is trying to get close to you, the, de- the key is to just get to close to Him that doesn't have any of that going on in His life. How do you deal with sin? Don't deal with it. Jesus did. How do you deal with sin? Don't deal with it. Oh, what do I need to do to get rid of this? Nothing. Jesus already did it. So what are you saying, Sam? I'm just saying go, get closer to Him that dealt with it. Well, Sam, don't I need to try harder? Don't I need to? There's some things, there's some strategies that God will give you, but He doesn't want you dealing with what's already dealt with. He wants you believing, believing, believing. And so the temptation's coming again. Temptation of pride, the temptation to live for self and to be this king in this world. And it comes again and it comes again, but there's something something that doesn't feel comfortable about this anymore because I should be living for others. I should be on mission and I should be living for others. And it tries to creep into your life, but then the Holy Spirit speaks to you and then all of a sudden, by association, we start to change. And I remember, you know, playing in, in, in bands. I, I used to play drums a lot growing up. And I'd play with these bands they, they, and my friends weren't Christians. And we'd drink, we'd binge drink. Binge drinking is huge in Australia. We'd binge drink. Um, and, you know, it's gross. We never, we never drank for any enjoyment. We drank to get drunk. And by association, I was comfortable. I never, there was nothing that ever came in my life that I knew what I was doing, fooling around with girls and different things that I knew that I was quite comfortable. That I wouldn't wake up the next day. I wake up the next day and would vomit. One time, I remember vividly, this is very embarrassing to say, 
But we woke up on a Sunday getting ready to go to church as a teenager and I was hosing down the front, I was hosing down my vomit off the front lawn. Dad came out and asked me to get ready for church. Wow. Talk about being comfortable in a place where I should feel compromised. But I'm just being honest with a place that many of us have been at before. Maybe you weren't hosing down your vomit, but maybe that's a metaphor. <laughs> trying to hide it. Not trying to hide it. Expose it. But then all of a sudden, you know, I found that I needed to be dead to the old way and I came alive to a new way. And I found myself at one point looking in the car, driving literally to a missions trip where I changed my associations. I changed who was in my life and I had, had shifted some things in my life and I found myself going on a missions trip preaching the gospel. Not very long after that, praying for people, knocking on people's doors. We invited one girl to, to a church service and her son was deaf in ears, could not hear anything and her son got healed that night. And I remember looking around at the car and saying, God, you're so good of how you could take something that was so embarrassed by the shames of sin and there wasn't a part of me that wanted to go back to what I was. There wasn't a part of me that, that wanted to return to it because it was now so uncomfortable and so foreign based on association. Somebody say, get close to God. It's your new identity. Be close to where that identity comes from. I'll just get the band up. Number three, God's life becomes reality. God's life, the life in God becomes reality as we are saturated by the Holy Spirit. Can you play that clip? There's no sound on it. I'm just going to preach to you. But this, saturated by the Holy Spirit, this is how we deal with sin, church. About 10 years ago, I was cleaning a, a blender that I made a smoothie and I left water just running in it in this blender and the Holy Spirit just saturated me in the moment. I felt the anointing of God. And then so I got the creative team to, to reproduce this clip and I've had it sitting there for 10 years but I just remember it but the dark in the vase is like our sin and the water is the purity of the Holy Spirit and God's, God wants you immersed, immersed, saturated, overflowing in the power of God. And the Holy Spirit is here and alive today. That as you get saved and the old is gone and the new is here and I feel the anointing of God in this room. That if you would just let Him pour into you and don't make it about you, but make it about Him. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 says this, I baptise you with water for repentance. This is John the Baptist speaking. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So the water is washing and cleansing, but the Spirit is filling and filling and filling and filling and filling and filling. And when you go to Connect Group and you go on team and you go to church and you come around the Word of God and you come to prayer and you go to God and you, and you pray again and He fills you again and fills you again by association and proximity with that that you were created for. He said to Adam and Eve when they sinned in the garden, He said, where are you? Not because He didn't know where they were, because they didn't know where they were. And the question the Holy Spirit is asking you right now, is are you going to keep trying to deal with all that black in your life? Are you going to keep trying to deal with all that dirt in your life? Are you going to keep trying to deal with the stains of sin all by yourself? And it was never how you were created to be. It was never the identity that you were created and made in. You guys can... Play whenever you want. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I just love what I'm preaching. Amen. See, now we're getting immersed even deeper. Praise God. Praise God. That joke's not going to land in the second service because they're already going to be playing. Thank you, Jesus. 11.30 service, I'm preaching to you. Baptism of the Holy Spirit right here. And in a few minutes, we're going to open up the room. Land a few minutes early so that you can saturate in the Holy Ghost and feel the anointing. It's meant to be, we can normalize it here in church so you can normalize it at home. When you feel tempted to rehearse patterns of the past that aren't your identity anymore, 
the solution is to be close by association, to be close to God. Perfection is not the goal. Pleasing God is. Amen. And let Him pour into your life. Let Him renew you, renew you. This process took five minutes on a screen. I mean, it might take five years. It might take 15 years, whatever. Just be filled. That's the whole idea with God, is He doesn't want you empty. He wants you filled. You try and take darkness out of your life. You can't take darkness out of your life. You just need to fill it with the light of Christ. You need to fill it with the anointing of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for this message. Thank you, Lord your presence right now. Let us be saturated in the power and the goodness of God. I pray right now for anybody that is feeling the weight of sin, that they would understand that they can believe in you and that they can throw off the old way and be filled with the goodness of God. In your name, Jesus.